Any questions or observations? Is there a difference or if there is a difference between what you do now or what you did at UNLV versus what you did at Georgia Tech? Is there a difference? The question was the biggest difference between what we do now and what we did do at UNLV. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of differences in terms of the, 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 the baseball things. Um, like I was saying, uh, um, where we are in our program today, uh, with support we have, you know, you know, from, at a really, really high level. Uh, I used to do, for example, I do it and when I was at UNLV. I was going to tell this story. Uh, you know, we inherited the job there. The budget was horrible. Okay, and I didn't care as long as they let us raise money. I said, hey, if, if I get to raise the money, if I raise a thousand dollars, do I get to keep a thousand dollars? They said, yes, sir. You do whatever you want. You want nine uniforms as long as you can pay for them. I have nine uniforms. So, if you can believe this actually happened, especially in Las Vegas. Uh, the biggest donor of the program owned the Coors distributorship, and still does. And they decided we're gonna sell beer in the park. Well, how are we gonna do this? Me and my associate athletic director on Thursday after practice, we would drive from one side of Vegas to the other, pick up all the beer, put it in his car, they'd set up a table, and at the end of the game on Friday night, they would bring me the cash. At the end of the game on Saturday, they would bring me the cash. At the end of the game on Sunday, bring me the cash. So I'm in Las Vegas, with like $4,000 worth of beer money, and understand I've never put a nickel in a slot machine, so I had no temptation. But if I was, uh, if I was a good gambler, I could have raised a lot more money. Uh, <laughs> made, a, made a big a lot less, but so, you know, things like that, but uh, otherwise, you know, I just really, uh, in, in every phase, like the discipline I was just talking about, um, we have our alumni weekend, and, and uh, now, and, um, all the players are around, and the first thing they start doing is they start telling stories about you to each other, and uh, we become good friends, and I'll be in that circle of players, and they'll start telling stories, and the one thing I learned is that they were, most of them remember some of the good things you say, they never forget when you wear them out. And I, and I remember going, man, I really said that to you? I was embarrassed. I mean, frankly, I was very embarrassed. And so I've, uh, I guess, I mean, I'm 46, so I guess I, I was a head coach at 30 at UNLV. Um, but I, I you know, certainly calm, calm down a little bit with age, or just figure out, hey man, this is, you know, I have a 17 year old son, 16 year old daughter, this is somebody's child. And uh, there's different ways to do that, to discipline them other than, other than that. Explain the Tulane Browns crew. So the Tulane Browns crew is this, we're getting ready to play, uh, you know, New Orleans is four feet below sea level. And, and so we're getting ready to play a game and, uh, is like I think it was maybe a Sunday. We're like, we have to get this game in somehow, and the field is underwater. And so we have all the players and all the coaches, and we're trying. And we, there was always a group of guys. At least they've always sold beer in the park. There was always about a group of eight or ten guys down the first baseline who were good fans and good guys and drinking beer and, and all that kind of stuff. And they said, hey, we'll help you guys. So they came out and helped us that day. And that evolved, and Coach Jones is the one to be credited for, that evolved into a volunteer grounds crew. If you've been in New Orleans, K-R-E-W-E, that's the Mardi Gras groups uh, that have the parades. And um, so what Rick did uh, is he just, you know, we couldn't pay those guys anything. Some of them were blue collar guys, one guy's a plumber. Little did we know, two of those guys owned their own company. And what he, he did is he just treated those guys so great Anytime our players got a golf shirt, they got a golf shirt. He, he just took care of them at the highest level, and they became our grounds crew. And they took so much load off of the players that, you know, it wasn't financial fundraising, but you think about that, that the things a baseball coach has to do. And so, and one, and, uh, one neat story off of it is that one of those guys that owned their own company, we, beat a, we hit a walk off uh, Homer in 1998 at Zephyr Field, the pro park there, to beat LSU. It was, you know, obviously phenomenal at the time, Coach Bourbon. And the next day, one of those guys walked in and said, I want to build you an indoor facility. And that's how that grounds crew helped us. So. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so, you know, um, I've only ever been a college coach. I mean, I wasn't, and so, you know, I don't know what it's like to, to, to deal with parents at the high school level, but, um, our, our philosophy with regard to parents is this, is that I tell parents in the recruiting process that I, I want to be the first call if something's going on with your child. Or you, if you haven't heard from them in four days because 
he's a lughead freshman and he didn't feel like calling his mom back, you can call me at two in the morning or two in the afternoon and I will get you what you need. I will answer your question, I'll find out, I'll help you. But I will never talk baseball with you under any circumstance, you know? And so if we're gonna discuss playing time, if we're gonna discuss development, um, then that's gonna happen with the player, period. Now, certainly, uh, the guys who are really good <laughs> and they play all the time uh, and you develop some relationship and you feel like you can trust maybe the dad who has not a question about lineup, but you know, if uh, Luke and Baker's dad calls me today and says, and he would never ask me about uh, his swing or anything like that, he may say, hey, you know, his, Luke went through some things with his arm last year, you know, obviously that's about the care of the player. What are, you, what are your plans? I have no problem, you know, discussing that. But that's just our policy, and um, I'm not saying it's the right thing. Um, usually the, the, the parents that like me are the guys that, that, uh, that play. And the one that you hope that the, guy, that the parents at least respect you. And my, when I did my student teaching, I did it for a, a really old football coach at Western Alamance High School in Burlington, North Carolina. And he called me in one day, his name was Mickey Brown. He said, boy, let me tell you something. Let me give you a piece of advice. You can take the most educated, you can take the most level-headed human being you've ever been around. When it comes to their child, they're the exact opposite. And, they're, don't, and don't ever hold that against them. And I've always tried to live by that. Um, and certainly when I had my own children, then you certainly see that, you know, my daughter's the greatest cheerleader and my son's the best, best baseball player. But um, you take all those things with a grain of salt. Coach Malone. You've already kind of touched on it a little, but I think you got a lot more funding. Can, can you give us a little bit of maybe where you wanted to go with the room in there? Sure. Um, I just think that I think there was a day in college baseball, at least, where, and I think the guy you played for, um, who, and this, that's fine, you know, this, that, that was a different era where I don't want to raise money. That's not, my job is to coach the baseball team. And I don't think that's the case anymore. I mean, I, you know, maybe, and it's, it's still the case at TCU. Um, it may not be the case at LSU when there are you know, the, the 10,000 people in the ballpark. But I think you have to, um, I think that needs to be a part of your program. And even if you don't need the money, I still think it's great to get, that's a way to integrate the community in your program. So one thing I was going to talk about was how to, you know, we want our facility to always be donor ready. It has to be recruiting ready. It has to be donor ready. If I walk a guy in at 11 o'clock in the morning, that's why the locker room, I showed you the picture, it has to look like that. Because if I have a bunch of money and, I, and some coach is asking me to invest in the program, I want to see that you're taking care of the things you already have before I build you a new locker room or before I turf your field or whatever those things are. Um, I think you know, it allows access, people access to the program. We talked about the two-lane grounds crew. Um, I'm a big believer in the, in the booster club. Um, to, you know, Coach, Coach Bergman started, I think, at LSU was the coaches committee, I believe, 50 bucks. And what that, at, at, when he first started, 50 bucks for 3,000 people was probably a lot of money at the time. But by the end of the deal, it was still 50 bucks. He probably didn't need the money, but it allowed, it, it just allowed people to have, uh, to have access to the program. And, and in my opinion, if you are going to sell your program, if you're going to be the one to sell your program, who's going to do it? You're going to leave that to the Associate AD, you're going to leave it to the high school principal or whatever. I mean, I think it's your job to, to sell the program. And, um, you know, again, we have, for us, from a fundraising standpoint, we have the, our, our Diamond Club with all different levels. And then we have, uh, we do a big banquet every year, um, which I, I wanted to talk about that too. Um, one thing I hate about baseball, especially college baseball, and it's probably the same in high school, is baseball players don't get, baseball seasons don't get celebrated. What happens when the football season's over? So they have a sweet banquet. I mean, unless the guys go into the NFL, the players are there for the next semester. Everybody can celebrate having a great season. In college baseball, we go. To, the last three years have been in the College World Series. Within 24 hours of us landing back in Fort Worth, they're gone. They're gone, and we didn't know, like what just happened. We were just battling against Coastal Carolina last night, and now everybody's gone. You know. And so with our banquet in, in, uh, we'll have here a week before the season, the first thing we do is as best we can, even though it's so far behind us, is we try and celebrate what happened last year. 
and and I think you know there's a, there's a fundraising side to that. So I don't know if that answered your question, but um, uh, you know that's just the way we do it. You know, I think everybody here is pretty interested in like the idea of culture, whether you're trying to build a winning culture or maintain a winning culture. I'm kind of curious as to how you structure, you know, your team reading that book or multiple books. You know, how do you structure that, and what do you think the benefits of that are for your for your guys? Yeah, you know, and that's why I think the classroom is really big because in the NCAA rules, at least for me, like I can meet with my team, and that doesn't count against our 20 hours a week as long as I'm not discussing baseball. You know, cut off a ring. So we try to use that classroom as like a life skills type thing, especially at certain points in the fall. Every Friday at four o'clock, we have a thing called a TOF, team organizational meeting. And in there, you know, I may do, we may do a Brian Kane thing. We may talk about, um, you know, I'll find an article that says, hey, here are the 10 qualities of most uh, successful people or five qualities of young millionaires and how these guys have succeeded. And so uh, we'll talk about those things. And then, for example, you're talking, you're asking about the compound effect. I'll just, um, I may give them that book over the Christmas break. Um, or I just may, I'll give them the book, but I'll, I'll have, a, we'll photocopy certain parts. And we'll just break it down and sit in there and talk about it um, with our, uh, early on when we're developing that selfless excellence and energy thing. Uh, as you saw, I think Coach Gilmore talked about yesterday. We ask, we ask, I, I ask our guys to stand up and talk about, right, what does selfless look like on a baseball field? Give me an example. What does it look like in the classroom? What does it look like socially? What does excellence look like with your faith? And what, is, what does energy look like um, on a baseball field in the classroom or socially? And just make them talk. And uh, if you saw in the picture that, um, of our classroom, there's a, if you saw binders on the table, we give a player a a binder that has a lot of stuff in it the very first meeting of the fall it has the schedule for the fall it has our policy manual that kind of thing but it also it's a way for them to it has 50 blank pieces of paper and it's a way for them to take notes and you know i want to be invested in those things and, and that's how we teach them and then that's how we got started and then as you you hope eventually that the older guys are helping navigate the young guys and and uh, we're now allowed to bring our recruiting class in in the summer uh, summer school prior to their freshman year and that gives me a great chance it's just them and I can really introduce them to those things um, in the summer before the older guys even get back but I'll, I guess to answer your question we are very intentional with it it's not just like hand your hey read this you need to act like this or you need to do this um, and for some guys reading's not going to do it you know we have to I mean I'm constantly going through YouTube looking for examples like my thing with our meeting the whole embrace the target thing that uh, Joe Baden is used um, when the Cubs were supposed to be so great before the season and some people run from that he embraced it and I, I'm trying to study that uh, to be prepared for what kind of we have to have um, to share with our players. Yes. Uh, what are the main adjustments that you have to make on and off the field with incoming freshmen that you recruit? Obviously you know what you're looking for in recruiting, but what main adjustments on and off the field do you that they struggle with? Off the field, it's just their choices. You know, it's just getting them to understand that every choice that they make is going to have an effect on their future. And when you're 18 years old, you don't believe that. So whether it be nutrition, academics, you know, I, I tell them, I, and this is true, I've never had a good player with a, with a low, I've never had a good pitcher that had a low, that had a really low GPA, a really low ERA. Those things eventually show up on a baseball field. And if you're so talented that and you're a bad student, and I say not a bad student because you're not the brightest guy. You know, Brandon Finnegan, who went straight to the big leagues, is not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But he, 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 I just asked him to be the very best student he can be. He was consistently a 2-4 student, which is fine. I'm not going to problem with that. But if you're making bad choices and you're a bad student because you're not going to class or you're lazy or whatever, then that will eventually show up on a baseball field, even if you're crazy talented. It may not show up for us in a regular season. It'll show up in Omaha. promise you. It'll, it'll show up in Pro Bowl. And so that's the biggest adjustment I would take right off the top of my head. And then on a baseball field, it's that getting them to conform to the team concept. And guys come to us, especially through, they play so much baseball in my mind. That is, uh, you know, we, we, and it's, some of this is our fault. We, we'll host a summer tournament on our field. And some of the groups that come in, they don't even care if the scoreboard's on. And, like, listen, man, we're playing, when you come here, like, the games count. Like, we keep score. 
There's a video board out there that's not just to show cool videos. It's because we have the, the, at the end of the see, at the end of the game, somebody has wins. And so, how to integrate that within the team concept? Like I was talking about important plays. Um, what do you mean? I don't just get to swing out of my rear end with a runner at second base and nobody out. Well, you can. You can get a pitch and you can. Hit. I don't want you just to tap a ball at second base. I want you to get a hit. But our job is to get the guy to third base. And so, I just think it's for the most part, it's those guys. We have, we have we we get talented players, but there's a difference between talent and skill. You know and learning how to actually play the game of baseball. We've done it many ways. We've had captains. Um, we've had appointed by the coach. They've had, we've had years ago, team vote, which was a horrible decision. <laughs> horrible decision. Even though they didn't, I'm sure they talked among themselves, but I didn't let them know who won was. Um, and I've done like the leadership council thing. And you know what, right now, I don't, uh, I, I don't make, I, I kinda, I don't say I let it happen, but I just, it, it, for us, it has kind of evolved. One thing I've done the last four years is we have our very first meeting of the year in the fall on a Sunday, the night before class starts. And we do it about 5 o'clock. When that meeting's over, I take all of the upperclassmen to dinner. Or anybody, even if it's a sophomore that I think, hey, this guy has people look up to him. You know, I take him to dinner. And what I do is, uh, is I bring a pad of paper and my phone. And I ask them like three, we go around the room after we eat, and I ask them like three questions. What are your expectations for the season? What are your expectations for yourself? How are you gonna hold yourself accountable? How are you gonna hold your teammates accountable? Right? And I just let them get up and talk. I don't say a word. And I write it down and I record it, right? And so throughout the course of the season, if something goes sideways, you know, Coach Tanner from South Carolina used to say, you know, my job is to kind of set the culture of the program, but the, really the players are going to set the expectation for what they allow. Because I don't care who, who you are as a coach, you're not, I'm not with them at night in the dorm. I'm only allowed to be with them X number of hours a week, so ultimately they're going to have to hold themselves accountable. And so when you get in those settings like that, that dinner, and um, everybody's gung-ho for the season, and they're ready to go, and they say all the things that you want them to say, right? You write it down. I, and then during the course of the year, I was like, hey man, I didn't say this, you said this, and you're not living up to it. Or I, I may call them all in the room and say, you, you know, I won't call out a specific player, but say, you guys aren't holding each other accountable. And you, wait a minute, you said you would, even though he was your buddy, you said you would hold him accountable. And so that's one of the things we do. And then, um, you know, just, it, 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 I allow, you know, this year we have, if you had two, we have our catcher, Evan Scout, and a pitcher named Brian Howard, who, have evolved and I've never called them a captain, but the players know that if they have a want to bitch about something, they can they can always come straight to me, but they can go to Evan and, and Brian, those guys will come to me and I meet with them off and on and say, Hey man, what's I'm not I don't have a pulse on this thing. Tell me what's going on. No, don't rat out a player, but just tell me, you know, where are we? No coach we're good or no coach we got a little issue with this. Um, but we've never I've never been captain guy. Please. Expectations for for the season expectations yourself or the other two questions? How are you going to hold yourself accountable? How are you going to hold your, your teammates accountable? Yeah, Coach, you uh, obviously recruited the best kids from the best programs. Give us a couple of things to the high school guys that you look at these guys and, and think back and say, what was your coach thinking? What, what, what are we missing? A couple of things that really stand out for you. Like from, from like what we, when, it, when a guy comes to us, Yes, sir. Um, well, I don't think there's anything that is earth shattering. I think the things that, and I don't think it's the fault of a high school coach because you don't have them as much. And again, I'm not slamming summer baseball, but there is so there are so many games played. There's so little practice, and so things like base running. Um, what do you mean I have to throw it through the cutoff, man? When I throw at such and such showcase, they have a radar gun up, and all it matters is if I throw at 93. And so it's just those things that that um, help win a baseball game. That that guys, that's that's our job. You know, in college, at least at, at TCU, is to try and help those guys learn how to play the how to play the game of baseball the way, in our opinion, the way it's supposed to be played. Um, you know, Matt, Matt Carpenter. 
for the St. Louis Cardinals. He played for us for five years. I, I wanted to tell his story too. He was, a, he was a train wreck for two years and then got hurt. Um, son of a high school coach. I don't know if Coach Carpenter's here or not. Um, his dad, but son, his dad's a, won a national championship at Elkins High School. And he, he uh, but he was a train wreck, you know, away from the field in a lot of ways. And, and uh, he got hurt in his junior year. He was my first position player I've ever been around. They had Tommy John surgery. And uh, he missed that year, played for us two more years, with a fifth year, was a fifth-year senior that signed for $1,000. And when he went out, he moved up three levels in his first summer of professional baseball, and the next year he was in the big leagues. And Matt Carpenter will tell you, and at least in college it was true, he, he was never the best player on our team in terms of talent, like hit the ball far, run fast, throw hard. But within our program, he learned how to play baseball. And from his dad, he learned how to play baseball. He developed skill. And so when he got in professional baseball, like I remember Tony DeRusso would say, God, this guy's like, he does this and he does this and he does this. And Carp would come back saying, you know, the things that I like get lauded for, I mean, those are the things we did every day at TCU. Like, I don't even think twice about it. Why wouldn't I play like that? You know? And so I think it's just some of those things um, that all good college programs eventually have to teach guys who, who, have, who have talent, um, but they're just... They're just not incredibly skilled on how to win a game. But I don't know that that's a high school coach's fault because I don't think you're winning enough, at least in this today. On that same note of recruitment, what are your recruitment criteria? Like, what do you, know, um, uh, that is, that, that's a hard question to answer. You know, it depends on the position. It depends, you know, with only 11.7 scholarships, you know, to me, the, the recruiting in college baseball for a private school like us it costs sixty grand. Sixty. You need eleven and a half scholarships. If I give a guy fifty percent, which is a massive scholarship on our team, I mean massive. There's less than there's less than five position players on our team that are on a fifty percent scholarship or more. But if I give you fifty percent, you got to pay thirty. If you can go to A and M for no scholarship for way less than that, right? And so we call it, you know, and we call this at Tulane, the three P's, the guy that can play, he can pass, he's a really good student. I mean, so that way we can combine academic aid and baseball aid and a family that can pay the difference, you know, or they may not be able to pay the difference, but they understand the value of the degree and they're willing to scratch and claw. So those are, you know, as we really talk about these specific, we, we try and, and that, so that transfers on the field, so we're looking for, we're looking for athletic players, that's an easy thing to say, but guys that play multiple positions because we can't sign four shortstops. We can't make it affordable for four shortstops. When I was at UNLV, we can make it affordable for anybody, you know? But at Tulane and TCU, it's really hard. So I need guys that, if my shortstop goes down, then the third baseman's gotta be able to play short, you know? Um, and so um, we're just looking for guys that can, can, can do those kind of things, and those are hard to find, and everybody wants them. So. It's a new day, and we can't run kids. And I'm sure that most of the people in this room were run uh, when, when they were ball players. How do you hold guys accountable when their body language is bad during practice, or when energy is bad, or when you're not getting the results, or when guys aren't hitting cut off? And how do you hold those, your players accountable? Yeah, I mean, if they're not going to, you hold them accountable by sending, by sending them home. <laughs> Simple. <laughs> if you're not going to do what we want, you're going to sit over here next to me. And that, I think part of, that's why I started the whole thing off is, if, you, if, you're at a, if you're working for an administration that is so caught up in winning and losing, then that's going to put more pressure on you as a coach to make decisions based on winning a baseball game. Well, I've been really lucky, and now you know, we've kind of created a little bit of a monster where people, now the AD wants to win. But the, three, the, the two previous athletic directors and, and the guy now, you know, hey, hey man, you run your program, and you make decisions that are in the best interest of the program. And I tell our guys, you know, I'm always going to look out for your best interest, but don't ever put, I'm not going to sacrifice our program over the course of time for you if you're not going to conform to what we ask you to do. And so, for example, Brian Holiday, who's catcher in the big leagues, if you, if you watch his play in 2010, he got an unbelievable amount of press or just his grind. He, he, would, beat, he would beat the guy at first base that hit the ball, back it up first base. Um, Brian Holiday's first um, practice, fall practice on a Saturday morning. And Brian Holiday likes to have a really good time. 
Okay? I mean, really good time. He's fun to hang out with now that he's out of school. But uh, uh, his, his first Saturday practice, he was late because he had a few too many silver bullets the night before. And so he shows up late, and Brian Holiday is a guy like, he, he'd rather play baseball than eat, right? And so he, can, he showed up, and he's, Coach, I'm so sorry. What do I need to do? Where do I need to run? You know, like, you need to run. Let's go home. I'll call you. And my, one of my favorite, I hate to say punishment, but consequences is, hey, man, you can go on home. I'll call you when I need you. And that may be tomorrow. That may be next week. You know, I mean, you say it as a month, but it's not probably not going to be that. But I, not, to me, and I used to be the guy that would run the team and, and do all those things, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, so I, I just, and that takes some, you know, that takes some cojones to do it, especially during the season. And it may cost you a game, uh, but I don't think it'll cost you a season. Or I don't, and I think it'll help your program. So, I mean, our, our players know, I mean, nobody's trying, I mean, Josh Watson's not, if he overthrows the cutoff man this year, he's not trying to do it. You know, he's not going to be perfect. You, you guys will probably watch us play sometime and say, what the heck was that guy talking about? You know, we're not doing anything right today. But um, they understand, and, and, I, and I just think you have to have the, just do, just do it. Just take away the thing they love the most. So when those players come back, I mean, have you seen a difference with them? And oh, like, yeah. Give me an example of, of a good one. Like when they come back after I sent them away? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they come back and they're the one apologizing. Or if I say, hey, man, I'll call you when I need you. <coughs> and I, if I haven't called him within 48 hours, he's calling me. Yeah. You know, and so, um, and I'm not going to send a guy away for missing the cutoff, man. But, I mean, I'm going yeah. I mean, to send him away because he was late. I'm going to send him I mean, some things that, like, the, some demands that, that we have of our guys is like expectations is number one is you're going to be on time. It's simple. When you're late, you assume that your time is more important than somebody else's time. And so that we're, we're not having that. Now, there may be this, and there's a difference between excuses and reasons. And the second thing I ask them to do after being on time is you have to communicate as a young adult. That cell phone, my cell phone's on me like to a fault all the time. So if we have, if we have a, something at nine o'clock, and something has going on at 8.40, call me. Coach, got a flat tire. Okay, man, we're, you okay? Yeah, good, right, just get here as soon as you get, can get here. You know, I'll work with you, but we can't have flat tires once a month, you know? And, uh, and so... Um, Do the, does like that player talk to other guys? Like sure. on the team, like, hey, oh, is coach still pissed off at me? Or is he gonna like talk to me soon? Sure you know? they do. So then they get, they get antsy. Oh, yeah, sure. It's good. They get antsy. And then by the time you get them back, they're super antsy when they're sitting in front of you in your office. And they're wanting to know what they need to coach. What do I need to do to come back? Yeah. Well, I think you know what you need to do, right? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, if we, we, we may break it down, but, you know, just the way we do it. What are your other non negotiables? You said be on time. Are there, play art. I mean, what, what else? Yeah. Uh, I wish I brought it with me because they have it in our policy manual. So our non negotiables, you're, you're going to be on time. You're going to be uh, communicate well as a young adult. Um, you are going to hold the program sacred, meaning that if you have a problem, you, you need to come talk to me about it. If you have a problem with your teammate, you need to go talk to him about it. You're not going to be a clubhouse lawyer and go, if you have a problem with this guy, and say, man, hey, I can't believe what he's doing right now. You know? um, or go outside the program and um, you know, start talking about things that are going on inside the program. And I wish that's something that you, you know, I'm sure there's times when it happens and kids go home and bitch and moan to their parents about playing time and stuff like that. But those are, the, you know, those are some of those, those non-negotiables, I guess. Hey, Jim. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if this is an appropriate form for this question, but we had a situation in the summer, and I think people would like to hear about this. And, and we had a player, and one of your players, and really we're not happy with him, and called you, and the next day, and for child, which is exactly what we wanted the rest of the summer, not just the next day. And I was curious, uh, what was that conversation like? Well, you know, did you guys hear what he asked? Just about guy going off. And it's amazing, man, what happens for something. I had that happen at Tulane a couple of times. Like some of the most amazing kids go off in the summertime. And for some reason, their profession, I mean, their perception of summer baseball is like, it's just to go, what's the movie, Summer Catch? I just go be like that. Um, and so, when, before they leave, I said, listen, we have, a, we have a saying, the jersey never comes off. 
Your TCU jersey is never off. Whether you, if you're in the bar on Friday night, if you're in the classroom, and if you're in summer baseball, you, you're representing our program. And so make sure so that we can have the luxury and the privilege of sending players to Coach Weinstein. Weinstein, I mean, it never comes off. And so when that happened, you know, I just picked up the phone and said, you know, what are you doing, man? I mean, that's your. I mean, how are we ever going to send a player back there? You're, 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 you know, you're misrepresenting our program, and and frankly, there'll be repercussions for that when you get back if you don't flip it around and don't start getting better reports. I think that's all I said. So, I'm glad that he. Worked, worked pretty good. Yeah, I'm glad it worked. I'm glad it worked out. What are your three levels? You can talk about your booster club. Like, what are your levels, and then like, what's the difference? So, if somebody gives. This amount, what did it get? Yeah, so, and shoot me an email on that, I'll just, or you can look up our uh, our Diamond Club brochures online, so I think it's, but I do have like a hundred, I try to have, like Coach Bergman had that $50 deal, we have a hundred dollar one, then it goes to 3000 <coughs> Um, We've all seen the TCU video, all the stuff that happens on the outside. How does that affect your players inside the program, mentally or physically? Those videos? Yes. <coughs> um, to, number one, I don't, I don't think they have, I mean, they, they love seeing them, but, but those videos that we make every year, right, to start the season, and I'll tell you how those, that came about. Um, but those are things we talk about every day anyway. So it's, they just like seeing it because the music's cool and the highlights may be neat, and they're a part of filming it. Actually, when I get back Monday, we're meeting with the advertising company that, that, that does it. But that, all those things started, that first one was Quiet Confidence, and the second one's called The Grind. The Grind has over like a million and a half views on YouTube. Um, I was just looking for something. Um, I said, man, we got to do a better job telling our story, like what our program's all about. And I wasn't looking for a highlight tape. I was just, thinking we could have highlights in it, but I just want, and so we had a kid that I knew on campus who was a film major, and uh, I met with him, and he had started his own company, and I wasn't paying 50 grand to do it, and my AD wouldn't let that happen either. And so, we st and he came up with the very first one, and it blew up, and now they're, they're actually really hard to live up to. Um, if you go and look on the comments on YouTube, like, in the last couple of years, you're like, oh, this sucks. It doesn't, it's not the grind, you know? Um, but, but they are, you know, they, they just help us. To me, you know, it's, I wanted something that if someone, if a, a parent or somebody calls, hey, what's your program all about? Hey, man. I'll send him a link and hey, watch this, and this is kind of who we try to be. Can you discuss more about the recruiting that you're going to talk about uh, in there, and like explain ABR and like maybe what you do with like uh, UCO transfers, maybe and the incoming freshman like ABR just means always be recruiting, you know. And that's our um, one of our, you know, this is, we just that's it's such the lifeblood of your program, um, and that doesn't mean you sacrifice. That's one thing that's a big challenge. I'm actually, I'm actually a proponent. I think college baseball needs to have more rules. Like we need to have six week periods like football where for six weeks we can go recruit and for the next six weeks we're not allowed to recruit. Like we actually, it's kind of cool to coach your own team, you know, um, instead of always being on the road all the time. That's a big, that's a big part, uh, anxious anxiety thing for, for a college coach is when you're home coaching your team in the fall and there's some showcase going on, you feel like you should be there. And when you go to the showcase, you feel like you should be. So we, we try and balance those things out as, as best we can. But at the end of the day, the most important part of recruiting is gonna be the success of our team. And so I ask our coaches that when in doubt, I don't want a pitcher throwing a bullpen without Kirk Sarlos there if we can help it. Um, I mean, me being a pitching guy by, at heart, I can, I can hang out and you know, pick up, pick him up sometimes, but I also don't want to screw it up for Kurt. So, um, but in terms of junior college players, obviously, uh, I love junior college players. You know, and the junior college players we get um, are the guys that went to junior college for baseball reasons. You know, they were they were under recruited. They, uh, you know, was underweight, under just not physical enough at the time, and they've all had great success with us and. I believe you build and maintain your program with high school players. You supplement your program with, with junior college players, and, and we've had a lot of success with that. And we don't have, I feel like we get them in our culture, and, and uh, they're around the guys who have been there, um, uh, you know, for a while. Then, then they mix in well, and, and most of the time we, 
you know, if you're getting a guy from Sac City or you're getting you know, from a great program who's doing things the right way, then it's not that big a deal. Uh, your team's always played to me with great energy, seem to play team first, you've been the College World Series three state times in a row. What's the most challenging thing for really kids that come to your program that are the superstars to how good they are their whole life? And all of a sudden, they're in there and they're just going to fall with you and it's a little overwhelming for them and they're not what you thought they would be. How do you develop players very well? How do you develop that player that is perceived to be something and he comes in and he's just overwhelmed and he's not getting like playing time? He's well, he was the first time he's ever sat and watched. Sure. How do you do that? It's not easy and it's not an overnight process. I mean, I think the first thing, that's why I hit on that selfless thing so hard, is, is trying. And it's not their fault most of the time, you know? And it's part, it's our fault, you know? Uh, shoot, I'm just as guilty as anybody. Luke, and you're awesome, man. You need to come to TCU and you're the greatest thing of all time. And so I've heard coaches say, you know, we gotta, they, they call it de-recruiting, where you're, now you gotta bring them back down a little bit. Um, we're trying to be realistic with them, but um, that's where the selfless thing, I think you teach, teach five different ways, guys, to, to teach guys how to be self. What does that mean? Well, when you're, going and visiting a young man that's gonna die in life, you learn pretty quick that this really isn't that big of a deal. And and certainly over time you you can you, they see examples of the guys who have when the team when the team goals are met, the individual goals always get met. We get Omaha, I get a new contract. We get Omaha, assistant coaches get raises, assistant coaches get head coaching opportunities. Guys I mean guys are the first rounders off bad teams usually, you know? And so um, and that's, and that, that, again, that's just a constant thing that, that we're always talking about. And then what's really cool when you've been in one place for a while is, I don't have to tell it to them, Michael Landestoy can talk about, hey man, I didn't, I read your, and look, look, look right, Matt Carpenter was here for five years, you know. Um, and so I think when the players start to help them along, and, 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 I, always, and I, I also believe this, I don't know if Coach Watson believes in this, but I think the biggest play, jump in a player's career is from is from high school to college. It's not from college to professional baseball. You know, professional baseball is crazy talented and, and it's a grind in terms of the, of the length of the season. But you take an 18, you take an 18 year old, um, when he goes into pro ball right out of high school, he's with other 18 year olds for the most part. In college, it's significantly different. And then you throw on this, the academics and you throw on the intensity of being in a place like ours with fans. And so well, I, I tell them, I said, guys, you, you think this is going to be like a, a jump? Man, you have no idea. And it's okay, man. It's okay. I don't, you know, and uh, we just try and put them at ease and you're going to suck. <laughs> I try not to, but there's going to be times where you are. So as long as you're, as long as you're a good guy and you're, and you're controlling your effort and your attitude, I got no problem with it, man. You know, we'll just put you right back out there and, and we'll figure it out. Um, but it, 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 it's not an overnight process. Right. Um, Coach at my high school. Um, you mentioned a little bit about like your ladies and games. You know, the big things you kind of had you've had success a lot with these uh, extra ball games, like the marathon. Just wondering, like, what's really helped you in this situation to see that you're really made the games winner or 22 or 16? You know, the big marathon, what really has helped you in this situation? Besides some serious dudes in the bullpen, yeah. <laughs> Riley Farrell throwing 96 with a great record ball. Um, that's the first thing. Uh, you know, I, I just think that it's a, you know, we talk about, it's all the things we talk about in our culture where it's never about the best team, it's only about the team that plays the best. And there's going to be adversity. Um, I encourage you to uh, Google uh, or on YouTube, there's a, a guy named Jocko, J-O-C-K-O, and I think it's Minnick, but if you just put in Jocko and the word good, there's an awesome video um, and it talks about, you know, you didn't get the promotion, good. Something's good, something better is gonna come along, right? You, uh, you lost the game, good, we got this. You know, it just means something else is gonna happen. And so those are things we talk about all the time, and I, I found that video last year, we, you know, end of the season, we lose our first two games on the road to Baylor. And, you know, if you ask Coach Rodriguez, he just got there, they weren't very good, and we were supposed to be good. And uh, one of my players, who's in AAA, Jansen Woody with the Red Sox, he still follows everything we do. And he, that night, he sent me that video. And I showed it to our team the next day. 
Well, that became a mantra for us the rest of the season. So we're, and I, I wish I had it on video, but we're in the Super Regional against A&M. You know, if you watch any of that, the atmosphere was just sick. And it's kind of all against us type deal. And something negative would happen, and you'd hear guys down the dugout, good, awesome, wear it, let's go. And, they're, and that's real. And I've seen dugouts where something, and our dugout has been like that before too, especially when you're host, man. It's a lot of pressure to win when you're supposed to win. And, uh, you know, something negative happens, and, and I used to be, now I just try to shut up, but I used to be really, really bad about creating more tension in the dugout than was already there. And I was horrible at that. I readily admit it. I used to, I used to do a thing I call personalize the performance of the players. And because I wanted to win so, I was never like that as an assistant coach. But when I got the head coaching job, I felt, you know, the wins and losses go next to your name. And what I've learned is that the practice belongs to me and the games belong to them. And we'll manage the game, but try to just support them as best we can and have us, have us be as lighthearted. When in doubt, be lighthearted. You know, unless it's attitude or effort. And so I think all of those things combined, and we talk about them every day, right? The whole uh, E plus R equals O, event plus response equals the outcome, right? So we know this year, I don't care what we're ranked, we're gonna play bad, right? We're gonna, we're gonna lose a series, we're gonna be on a losing streak. You know, those, those things are gonna happen. We know that now, it's easy to say that in January. How are we gonna respond to it? So we'll, we talk about that right now in our classroom, you know? How are we gonna, you know, how are you gonna, how are you gonna handle going two for 14 over the weekend? You gonna throw your stuff? Or are you just going to, hey man, wear it and go? Um, Matt Carpenter, he comes back every year and he goes, you know, if I play every day, if I play 150 games and 60 games in the big leagues, I'm going to have three to four, like, over 20s or two for 30, 31s. And, you know, for example, what he used to do is go back, he says, and look at his swing. And what he's realized is very rarely about his swing. It's always, it's, it's just about the pitches that he swings at. You know, when he's going good, he swings at the good pitches. When he's going bad, he, he swings at the bad ones. And uh, and that's I'm getting beyond your beyond your uh, question, but those are you know controlling his emotions and know, knowing that that's going to happen. When you know what's going to happen, it's a lot easier to kind of uh, be prepared to handle it. Coach, I think a couple of years ago you started. We watch you on TV and you see your hitting approach. Not only down the deck, the guy in the holes and the exit of the dugout. So that's a Brian Kane thing. So, so we 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 really believe in imagery, by right? and you know, the saying is your your mind can't differentiate between what you physically experience and what you visually imagine. Like it, it literally doesn't. Like if you if you close your eyes and you start thinking about something that's stressful to you, your heart rate's going to go up, right? And so, so one thing you know, some some of those things are the guys like we have a it's not a high tech thing, but it's just a system. Like you get the guy you get the guy hitting. You have the guy on deck, you have the guy in the hole, and then you have the guy that's after him. Well, when does your, the question would be, when does your at-bat start? Does it start when you step in the box? Does it start when you're in the on-deck circle? So we try and define, you know, hey, I'm three guys away. What are you doing? What's your routine? I don't care what your routine is. You just need to have one. Well, and one guy may say, well, it starts when I put my batting gloves on. And I sit down, and I'm two guys away, and I'm watching the pitcher. And then I'm in the hole, and now you know, uh, Coach Bianco at Ole Miss does an awesome job of this. They draw a line, they actually take an on deck circle in their dugout, and they have it right there. And that guy's, you know, because you're allowed to have one guy on deck, and that guy's getting ready to, he's trying to go through in that bat with the hitter. And the, but then the other thing we do that you probably see is if, uh, if Luke and Baker's hitting, and he's the first baseman, and he's going to play a lot, and I'm the backup first baseman, well, how can I best be ready to play when my time's called? If you believe in imagery and those things. I'm gonna go through an at bat every single time Lubin hits. So you'll see some guys, and some guys, I don't make them do it. If a guy's injured, like, and I'm counting on him coming back, I'll make him do it. I know I'm gonna get him back in two weeks, and I'll say, when so-and-so gets up, make sure you're going through your mental AB with them. And so they, so they, go, uh, they, they go through the at bat, and that's probably what you see on television. The other thing we do, which we want to talk about there, Kirk Sarlos does an awesome job, is uh, when you watch us play, uh, from the first inning to the seventh inning, unless there's somebody to get him loose to actually come in the baseball game, he assigns two pitchers to every inning. And so in the first inning, it might be you and I. 
And our job when we're in the bullpen is we are going to mimic everything that happens on the field. Every single thing. So if Coach Cobb back there is the pitcher on the field and he comes set and picks the first base, you'll see the two pitchers in the bullpen come set, then we'll throw a ball and pick the first base. If he throws to home play, I mean, he, they, may, they may not know it was a breaking ball, but then they throw to home play. And so, and we do that every inning. A little side funny note to that is we've had the same radio guy for 20 years. And he still say, what's the third inning? And Schlossnagel's got two guys up already. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Chuck, you've been here for 20 years. I told you what we do. There's no baseball. There's nothing. Sometimes you've got a catcher. Come on. <laughs> but... Uh, um, but yeah, those are and those, those are just things that and, and, and we had a kid, we had the guy who's our number one, you know, number one this year. And if you watch the first game, the this championship game of the Super Regional, Brian Howard, the big six nine, that big around kid, his freshman year, he didn't pitch at all. He had thirteen innings on his on his, on his freshman year, but every single game he did that. We got in that in that twenty two inning game. I was down to. I didn't. Well, I wasn't. We were the visiting team, so I wasn't going to bring my closer in. I wasn't going to bring Riley Farrell in until I felt like we had a chance to win the game. And Howard was the last guy left before Farrell, and in like this seventeenth inning or whatever it was, came to him. And if you ask him, he'll say, "You know," I said, "Were you nervous?" I was anxious. I said, "But all my stuff in the bullpen, I felt like I'd already thrown eighty innings, <laughs> you know." And I know Cal State Florida, not, I forget the guy's name, but I know they had a kid one year where and they used to uh, they used to do the same thing and they would put the team around the guy and yell at him and have him go through some visual inflation. And I think those things work, but that's, you know, that's just for us. Your right. teams from the past um, played with a lot of energy. They always play with energy, but they played really fast, almost like trying to play faster than other teams. Could you talk a little bit about what you've learned about how to coach with energy, but I'll sort of breathe and slow down. Sure. Yeah, there was, we got a lot of publicity for for that for a while, and uh, I still believe in it. Um, I think we've come back off it a little bit because I, I want the guys to be. Uh, I mean, I want I don't want to kill them in, in, in the course of the game, but we still. I mean, there was a time where during inter squad games, I had somebody keep a stopwatch as to you know if you're in the third base dugout, the right fielder's going to be off the field at this amount of time. And, I, and that's why I think I think culture evolves over time. And there are maybe a, if I was to be a coach at somewhere else, then I, then I may go back and do all those things because I feel like we got to get to the we got to get to this point until I feel good about it. And then okay, you know, you, there are some things, especially with age, where you, you just this isn't as important to me anymore. That is still really important to me, but on a scale of one to ten, it might be an eight, where then it was a ten. You know, facial hair used to be a thing that was like all important to me. And honestly, I woke up one day and said, you know what, I'm tired of like telling so-and-so, dude, you need to clean that up. So now what we do, you have to be clean shaven in the fall, every day, every single day. And then depending on how we do academically on the field, I mean, academically in the classroom, then basically if they make a 3-0 or better as a team, and it was just tough to do at TCU in the fall, then I'll let them you, I'll just say, you gotta be growing something. That's, if it's a goatee, cool, if it's a mustache, fine, a good beard, you know. But I reserve the right at any time to say, you know what, we have our banquet and everybody's got to be clean shaven. So with regard to that, I just, uh, it's still important to me, but I feel like we've set a tone, we've set an expectation, and uh, we've kind of stayed that way. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I uh, I, I've just been really lucky, you know. I mean, I was, like I said, I wasn't that good of a player, and Coach Jones talked me into being a student assistant coach, and then I was working camp one day at, at uh, Clemson, and if you're old enough in this room, the coach at the time was a guy named Bill Wilhelm, who was coach at Clemson for 37 years, and, and he called me in and said, we have this new horrible thing called a volunteer coach, and guys, and I, I just timed it perfect. A lot of guys lost their job, because back in, 1992, uh, you could pretty much have as many coaches as you want. Mississippi State wanted to pay seven coaches, pay seven coaches, but the NCAA cut everything back, which ended up being perfect for me because guys were leaving, and I'll work for free. At Clemson, are you kidding me? Come on, 
And so that, that jump started my career and I was able to be a head coach at 30. And, but uh, for me, it's just more and more and just enjoy our players, man. And uh, sometimes I get caught up into winning and losing too and the season ends and you know what? Jake Arrieta is gone and I see him some, but did I really enjoy the time that I spent with him? Um, so I, I just try to get better at our processes and uh, I mean, we haven't won a national title, but that's, that's so hard to do, man. You know, uh, that's just a baseball thing in my mind. But no, we, uh, I appreciate you saying that, but I'm lucky. Coach, how are you doing? Yeah, go ahead. You have great assistant coaches from Randy, obviously, and, you know, Kurt. Um, what do you do to mentor these guys when they're all pod going to use it? How do you, what do you do in, in back to the mentor? <coughs> It's a great question. What I try to do is what was done to me is I try to include them in everything. You know, now they may, I'm not going to ask, if I have to go speak and Kurt just got off, of, off the road recruiting, I'm not going to make him come with me so he gets to see that or be a part of that. But they're, they're a part, I try to include them in, you know, if I'm, if I'm dealing with a fundraising issue or something with the athletic director or a facility, I just try to include them in everything because, you know, when I worked for Coach Jones, I did, I was, my first year at Tulane, I was a restricted earnings coach, which means you made $12,000, you couldn't make more than $12,000 during the academic year, and you couldn't make more than $4,000 in camp. They had that in basketball and baseball, there was eventually, eventually a lawsuit, but I was a restricted, I went from zero to 12, so big jump. And, um, uh, but he, you know, I, I did the scheduling, I, uh, I was the field guy, you know, field maintenance, um, summer ball placement, all those things. And so I try as best as we can to, to include those guys in that. The difference, the challenge now is that we're at a place that's like super committed. So like we have a director of baseball operations and that person does all the travel, which I used to do all the travel. And so I think there are some instances, not all, where guys aren't as prepared as they used to be because if you're coming from a place like LSU or you know us on a little bit smaller scale um, you don't have to do as much you actually do just get to coach baseball and recruit but I don't think that prepares you to be a head coach as well as it could so I just try to include them so that when they go out they can at least say they've been around you know anything else all right fellas Take care, have a good day.